Good evening, everyone. My name is Noah Newman. I'm a third year medical student at Wake Forest School of Medicine, and welcome to tonight's virtual town hall. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically changed the medical community across the United States. Students and institutions have had to rapidly adapt to continuously changing circumstances and guidelines. These changes have left students and institutions to adjust without much precedence or guidance of how to best do so. Tonight's virtual town hall is for pre-medical students and medical school applicants to voice your questions. It is for leaders in the medical education system to voice the challenges they are facing. We hope you and your peers will tune in to help bring these important conversations to the national stage. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce two of my friends and collaborators who worked very hard with me on tonight's show. Me, Troy, and Miller, fourth year medical students at Emory School of Medicine. So Troy, Miller, thank you again for all your hard work. It's very much appreciated. Uh, I'd like to have you guys briefly talk about um, the YPI organization, um, which helped so graciously in hosting tonight's events. Sure, I'd be happy to do so. So YPI uh, stands for Young Physicians Initiative. Um, and it's an organization that started here in Atlanta um, that connects medical students with uh, high school and college students where medical students can act as sort of mentors, advisors, hosting workshops and small group mentoring events. Um, and a lot of the schools that we work with have a high percentage of um, underrepresented or minority students. Um, and, and we feel, so one of the main missions of YPI is to allow all um, prospective medical students to have access to high high quality mentorships. And, and that's actually really the, the motivation for putting on this event um, and why um, YPI uh, has, been, has been trying to do this um, for a long time. And, and hopefully this will provide us with a good medium to do so. Um, Miller, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, Noah, you know, I just wanna thank you for, for putting this together as well. Um, you know, we couldn't do this without one of our mentors, um, Dr. Kelly who um, you know, started YPI and really helped us with putting these events together. And, and for him, I think part of this mission, as Troy said, was, was connection. Um, and in medical school and, and, and especially applying, having those connections is, is important and we don't all have them. Um, and so we hope with YPI and with this event to kind of be that connection for you and, and to reach out to you as you start this process or, or now in the midst of it, um, and as you get to your schools, I, I hope um, when you get admitted, you think of YPI, you reach out to us and try to expand, because again, we just want to reach out to students like you and, and kind of to pay it forward. So thanks for being here tonight. Thank you guys both for sharing that. Um, I really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys a little bit later in our show. So um, in just a second, we're going to be introducing our panel of medical school admissions faculty. And they'll be answering your and our questions in a live Q&A. If at any point you have questions for our panelists, please post them in the comments section. We will do our best to share them with the panelists. Now to our panel. Tonight we have Ms. Amy Ahern, the Assistant Director of Admissions at the University of Iowa Carver School of, or Carver College of Medicine. We also have Ms. Jennifer Kimball, the Director of Admissions at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. I want to thank you guys both so much for being here tonight. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. Yes. Thanks, Noah. Um, so we'll do this Q&A. We'll start off by uh, posing some questions that we've written. And then to all of our audience members, uh, go ahead and submit comments below with any questions you have. And yeah, we'll post them to our, um, to our panelists. So uh, the first question that we're going to ask is, um, students who are planning on applying this upcoming application cycle, how can they communicate some of the impacts um, that COVID has had on them, their communities, um, and their application process to these schools that they're applying to? Um, and Ms. Kimball, we can start with you. Sure. Um, so uh, to back up a little bit more, the AAMC created kind of an ad hoc group um, and I was on that. And what we did is we kind of helped compile all of the medical schools who were offering a secondary question to answer that very 
you know, topic. How do you address how things might have altered your pathway um, due to COVID? Um, what we found is that different schools asked it in different ways. Um, you know, how did this impact your uh, extracurriculars? How did this impact your academics? That kind of thing. Um, pretty much every medical school will ask some sort of secondary question regarding how COVID has affected uh, your life, um, personally, educationally, extracurricularly, all that stuff. Um, and a lot of schools are going to have that question in place on their secondary for several years, not just this one year and, and kind of move past it. Um, I, I don't wanna hog the entire conversation because I do wanna allow Amy the opportunity to also chime in, so. Yeah, no, I think that our, our take is a little bit different. So it's good that we have different perspectives on this. Um, so our committee actually decided to not ask a separate question on the application. Um, specifically about COVID-19. But what I am encouraging applicants to do is to explain anything that you think is relevant that our committee needs to know about in an update on your secondary application. So through after, after you apply to Carver, you can send us three additional updates. And that's where I'm coaching students to put anything that they want to provide context for, for our committee to understand in that section. There may be other questions on the secondary that lend you to have something to say about your experience with COVID-19, and that's completely appropriate if you'd like to put it there, but we will not have a separate question. I'm coaching students to put it in an additional update. And that's also the place where, let's say you had one semester where grades just were not indicative of what you can do academically. Let's say there was a death in your family or something, something horrible happened. Um, that's where I encourage people to put an explanation there in an additional update to provide some context for a committee so that they can't make any assumptions. You're providing the context that they need to assess your application in the right way. Okay, yeah, I, I love that both of your schools are taking a slightly different approach to sort of the same issue. Um, so the next question is regards to the MCATs, and I know that this is traumatizing probably for a lot of students who studied so hard for many weeks and months ahead of time. Uh, and schedules got thrown off, things were canceled. So are your schools going to look at the, or evaluate these MCATs differently this year, or is it going to be sort of the same policy? Um, I'll, I'll let you guys sort of elaborate on that more. Uh, Miss Ahern, we can start with you. Well, I wanted Jennifer to go first on this one because <laughs> to see if hers was a little, a little different. But um, so our committee will still take the MCAT into serious consideration. Um, we do understand that things have been crazy this spring and summer with no questions. Um, the MCAT still is a true indicator for our committee of how students will perform. So they're not willing to walk away from it or ignore it for a year. Um, but we will take test dates up until the end of September. Um, so if we wanna get into deadlines and things like that in a little bit, we can talk through that. Um, it's still gonna be required. They still will take it seriously, um, but we will take test dates up until the end of September. So hopefully that gives people a little wiggle room if they needed to replan or retake um, in the light of everything that's been going on. Um, pretty much the same thing for us. Um, okay. I really want to make sure that candidates know you are so much more than an MCAT score. Um, if it was just an MCAT plus GPA equals, yes, you're going to get accepted or no, you're not. My job would be super easy because all I would do is just put those two numbers in and it would generate a list and these people would get accepted and these people would not. You're so much more than that. And we get it. We understand um, our the students that I work with at Vanderbilt Med School, the faculty, we are all commiserating this with you. Um, this is not a fair year that you're having. Um, and so we get it. And so much like Iowa, we will take your MCATs up to the last possible minute. Um, I think we may talk about kind of like the timing and stuff in a future question possibly, um, but, but just to recognize that you're, you're more than an MCAT score. Um, we look at kind of the complete applicant. 
Right. Okay. So uh, just one question I have to sort of clarify. Um, are you guys both saying that students can submit their applications first and then submit their MCAT later down the road? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And um, in my former life, I used to be a pre-med advisor. Um, shout out to Emory because I was the pre-med advisor at Emory and at Georgia Tech uh, for 13 years before I came to the dark side of admissions. Just kidding. It's, not really <laughs> it's a light side. Um, and I would you know, tell my candidates, if you're not really 100% sure on how you're going to perform on the MCAT, but you're ready to go and you want to go ahead and apply this cycle, it's expensive to apply to a lot of medical schools. So you can at least get the ball rolling with the verification process for one medical school. Um, so go ahead and do your AMCAS application um, and send it in. It's supposed to take about four to six weeks to verify your, uh, your AMCAS application. Um, and uh, that'll get the ball rolling. Once you get your scores, if you're super excited, you can always add additional schools to your list. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So our next question um, has to do with uh, students who are going to be non-traditional students matriculating into medical school. So for a lot of those students who have had one or multiple gap years, um, and with this current year, maybe they've struggled finding employment or shadowing opportunities or clinical experiences due to COVID-induced cancellations. Um, what advice would you have for students who are facing that issue? Um, and Ms. Kimball, we'll start with you first this time. You know, it's really hard to give like a blanket answer like, I think everybody should do X, Y, and Z just because people's situation, it's so very different. For some people, their family um, has found themselves in a situation where everybody has to go and just make money. Um, so it wouldn't be fair for us to go, well, gosh, Becky obviously doesn't wanna be a doctor because she didn't do research this year. Maybe Becky had to get a job waiting tables at Chili's just to bring cash into the house, you know? So we're, we, we get it and that's why like I said earlier on our secondary, that's why we are asking you that question of how has, things altered um, due to COVID. So honestly, it, it really depends. There's no silver bullet. Like the secret that all med schools want you to know <laughs> is during this time, we want you to do X, Y, and Z. Really, it just depends on, on what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, going back to your psychology classes, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're kind of on that basic, that first level here, survival uh, for some people and, and we get it. So. Right. Right, that was a, a great MCAT psychology section reference. Miss <laughs> uh, Ahern, do you have any additions to that? You know, I think that was really well said, Jennifer. I think that, you know, when I've been talking with prospective students for years about their application, this isn't the time to shit on ourselves. I should have done this. I should have done that. This isn't the time to have regrets. This is the time to package your very best self so that someone can learn more about you and understand who you are as a person, where you've come from, and the road that you traveled. And all of those things are extremely important to admissions committees. And I think this year, while it might feel to applicants that the anxiety is high, the unknowns are larger than ever before. I also think the opposite side of that coin is that admissions committees are going to have to be as open-minded and lenient as they've ever been. So that could be a really good thing. So though this feels very intimidating and uncharted waters and things like that, know that the boundaries are probably breaking open every day for what committees can and will consider um, probably in ways that they never have before. So let that be sort of empowering for you, this cycle mm -hmm. to think about. Right. Okay. Um, well, the next question uh, that we're going to ask is in regards to rolling admissions. So are rolling admissions going to be similar or different than or this cycle than in previous? Um, and this one is from the audience. Um, I know that's sort of a, a vague maybe question, but um, Miss A here, and if you could, uh, or A here. Sure. You, could. you bet. So one thing that I'm going to tell you a big secret, and I don't know if I should or or not, but I'm going to. Um, so 
AMCAS delayed the transmission of their data for us by two weeks. Okay. So everybody's thinking, oh my goodness, what is that going to mean? Well, here's the secret. We all really like the 4th of July and taking a little break early July. So we never cared until about this time. So <laughs> though everybody tells you, you have to have your application in the day it opens. The first is definitely where you want to be. Turns out we didn't actually do anything with it until about this time anyway. So um, though that might feel like a huge amount of new information for us, we didn't change anything in our process in reality. So um, the rolling admission will still go on like it normally does. Of course, all of the schools, October 15th will be the very first day they can offer any acceptances. Um, it might take us a week or two later to get invites out for interviews. I'm not sure if it will, um, but that's also the beauty of the holistic review is that it takes a long time, right? Um, our deadline to apply is December 15th, and that's how it has been since for the last five plus years that I've worked here. So our deadline to apply didn't change. And that's the thing that a lot of applicants don't realize is that you need to look at the entire pool and we want to. And we want to look at those applications that are rolling in later because there could be some diamonds that are coming in later on in the cycle and we want to make sure that we find them. So I guess that is a very long-winded answer to tell you. Um, the rolling admission will still start to roll um, right on our right after October 15th. It will continue to roll. Um, and we really haven't changed any deadlines in our cycle with the exception of taking those last MCAT dates in September before we had previously cut it off about the middle of September. And now we're going until September 30th. OK, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Uh, Miss Kimball. Yeah. So much like um, Iowa we enjoy the 4th of July week. Um, in fact, I I was on vacation last week. I didn't open any files last week. Um, so uh, today was my first day back in the office. And um, I looked to see, you know, how many files were coming in and started to send out a, a couple of secondaries and um, then went back and continued answering all my 50 million emails that I received. All those <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we really um, don't expect the two week delay to cause us any major changes with our, our process. Um, we just, we don't. The only deadline that we have extended uh, was we have a program called MIDP for candidates who already have PhDs in engineering or applied sciences who now want to get their MD credentials. Mm -hmm. um, and due to that, we just pushed back their deadline to be a little bit more appropriate to make sure that um, we didn't have any last minute files that kind of came in um, with the delay. So, so, yeah. Okay. That's great to know. Thank you. Uh, so the next question that we have uh, is about shadowing. Um, and this was um, adapted from a question submitted by the audience. Uh, so for those who can't shadow in person, uh, how do you recommend obtaining clinical experience? Um, and kind of tagged on to that is how important is shadowing and clinical experience to you guys in candidates? Uh, so Ms. Kimball, we can start with you. So, um, to me, I am not a fan of requiring shadowing hours. Um, we have made it a policy at Vanderbilt not to require it. It is truly a barrier to the entry to the profession if you are not from the social capital of being able to call your neighbor or your aunt or grandma or whatever to shadow them. Um, you can't just cold call a doctor and say, hey, uh, yeah, I would like to um, shadow you. They'd be like, no, click. I mean, so we do not require shadowing hours. But I will say it really does help you to have some sort of patient care exposure as you're applying to medical school. It helps you formulate that question of why do you want to be a doctor instead of, well, I just like science, I like to help people. So being a doctor is the right fit for me. Um, I used to tell my students, if you love science, you love to help people, you should be a high school biology teacher. Um, so, um, but by getting patient care exposure, it just kind of helps you have a, a more well-rounded answer about why you want to be a physician. It only helps you out as an individual. Um, so due to the COVID world, 
Um, I think it would be helpful to possibly do some informational interviews where um, you do cold call a doctor, if you will, or, or network maybe through your undergrad um, career counseling office or alumni association. Um, you're not asking to shadow them as you're with patients or whatever, but you're just asking them questions. Um, pretend you're a reporter or something and you're just asking questions like, what's the hardest part of your day? What's what's the most fulfilling part of your day? Um, where do you see medicine going and stuff? Um, once again, we, we get it. We know that it's going to be even harder to get medical exposure in this new world. Um, but once again, it just kind of goes back and kind of helps you um, formulate why you want to do that. The one other addition I would say to that, if people are going, gosh, if I do that, how do I get credit on your application? You make the AMCAS application fit your needs. So mm -hmm. if you need to enter it in as an extracurricular activity, informational interviews and, in, you know, in the description say, um, I reached out and contacted area physicians to learn a little bit more about their day. I talked to Dr. Jane Smith, the pediatrician, you know, whatever. We would love that because it shows initiative and that's something that's so very important um, in the, in our future physicians. Right. Oh, I love that. Uh, and Miss uh, Ahern. Yeah, well said, Jennifer. I was a career advisor before I took this role. Um, for I was a career advisor for about eight years. So I love informational interviews. Love them. And if you if you're thinking, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. That sounds hard. So just Google U Iowa careers with an S informational interviews, and you will go to a page. It has sample emails. It has questions you can ask. Everything. I was part of the team that put it together ten years ago. Of course, it's been revised, but it's all there for anyone to use. So feel free to let that guide you through. It's really good stuff. And it I, I can't stress it enough. I know that shadowing feels like yet another hoop to jump through in the application process. However, I think it is the best way to learn truly what you're getting into and not what you see on Grey's Anatomy or what someone tells you secondhand about what the job will be, um, but truly learning what this could look like in your life and how it will fit with your life. It's, it's one of the best uses of time. So I realize it is a hoop, but I can also understand the value of it too. So, okay, that's my soapbox about informational interviewing. And um, also one other thing, somebody in the question, you know, what can you be doing in this time to get clinical experience? So I did a program a couple of weeks ago, um, just basically about that. What can we be doing now? And so I just went on our local volunteering website um, in our community just to see what's out there now. And there was, um, they were in high demand of temperature takers at retirement homes and it's no contacts. So you're not actually coming close to people if that's outside of your personal comfort zone. Um, and food banks were in crisis states. So those are two places right now that need people. That's not an Iowa City thing specifically, that's an all over thing. So those are two things I want you to think about. Um, we also have a mobile clinic. So if you Google you Iowa mobile clinic, um, there are telehealth volunteer opportunities um, that even pre-health students can take advantage of. So there are opportunities out there. Sometimes you just need to be pretty creative with how you're finding them. Right. And I think that actually ties in really, really well to something Ms. Kimball mentioned earlier about taking initiative, um, you know, looking for those opportunities, seeking them out. Uh, I think that's really great for students to be doing. So uh, the next question we have is from the audience. Um, and this one is about uh, courses online versus uh, in person. Um, so it looks like um, the question is, what is the best way to navigate taking science online versus in person? Wait until classes <laughs> in person or just take them in or online? Um, and particularly, I wonder this is a lot of these science classes are requirements or mandatory uh, for some medical schools for entry. So do the admissions have any preference with uh, the medium of these classes? Um, Ms. Kimball, we can start with you. Okay, we don't. Nope, we don't either. <laughs> nope, <clears throat> we get it. I mean, Vandy undergrad, I mean, we're all moving to these different models. We're fine. Yep, oh, same here. Don't sweat it. Nope. <laughs> 
Oh, great, great, awesome. That that's easy. Check. I feel uh, bad. That was a huge question, and we're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, you're fine. We're so hard typing it too. <laughs> uh, so the next question we have uh, from the audience. Um, it says, with rising COVID cases in much of the country, do you anticipate interviews in person or are you preparing to use the AAMC VITA program or is your school adopting another format of interview? Um, and for those who don't know what VITA is, I believe it's the um, video interview tool assessment. Um, and I guess it was rolled out just this year uh, to tackle sort of this long distance COVID interview problem. Uh, so Miss Ahern, we can start with you on sort of what the interview process is going to look like. Sure, can... sure. So we have not made our formal decision just yet, but it's looking like we'll be using our own virtual format for interviews. Um, we will not be using the VITA um, interview product this year. Um, it's looking like we'll be virtual um, with our own interview format, uh, likely we'll be using Zoom is what I anticipate. But the thing that we really want to make sure we do well is provide some context for applicants to be able to imagine themselves on our campus and imagine themselves in our buildings and with our students. So if there are ideas you all have about how we can do that and Things that you're thinking about, you know, as you anticipate what could potentially be a season of mostly or entirely virtual interviews, if you have ideas that would help you make informed decisions, I will put my email on the end of this chat and you can just fire away at me because that's what we're trying to picture ourselves in your shoes and thinking about where will I attend medical school? Where am I going to spend all of this money and time? And in order to make an informed decision about that, you're asking me to do this without setting foot on your campus. That's the part that's making all of us stay up at night, to be honest with you. So um, know that that's not lost on us, that we are not expecting you to make decisions without all the information you need. Um, maybe it'll be more visit days later, um, yeah, we're thinking about everything. So we'd love to hear some thoughts that people might have. So when you email Ms. Ahern with your brilliant idea, you can see me, I will also give you my email address. Um, we are going to do virtual interviews. That has been decided. I, I can't in good faith ask people to risk their health flying into Nashville and going to a hotel and then taking a here, yeah, I, I just can't justify it. So we're doing it all virtual. Um, what does that look like? Million dollar question. <laughs> um, because much like Ms. Ahern, I mean, our biggest, I guess, uh, publicity or or selling point, for lack of a better term, about Vanderbilt is the people you'll be with. Like your classmates that are currently at Vanderbilt Medical School are like the funniest, nicest caring, compassionate, collaborative people you'll ever want to meet. And I'm sure that Ms. Ahern feels the same way about the University of Iowa students she works with. I mean, they're really like the people you want to spend all day with. Um, our faculty are, are hysterical. Um, <laughs> I, they crack me up. Um, one of your professors um, is obsessed with the Tiger King. And um, and will text me funny memes about Tiger King. Um, so, and these are the people who are teaching you. So um, it's just a fun place to, to be. Like um, what I always tell prospective students is like, think about your favorite class and your favorite professor. That's what you will have for four years <laughs> in interval. Like it's just a fun place to be. We're, we're happy folks here. So we're trying to figure out what is the 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 big takeaway that you're going to get doing a Zoom interview for you to remember your experience at Vanderbilt Zoom versus University of Iowa Zoom versus mm -hmm. you know XYZ Med School's Zoom, you know, because they're all going to get kind of blurred in your brain. Um, so we just we I don't know we can't figure that that magic selling point out on how to make that happen virtually. So happy to, 
take any recommendations the students on this uh, call have for us. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, I was thinking before we started, Ms. Kimball, I need to find out how Noah made that video at the beginning of this because I felt I was ready to be uh, Anderson the Cooper when the yeah. video was over. That was really impressive. So yes. we might have to look to lots of um, yeah. medical students to, to help us too. Well, <laughs> it's funny because our students do videos. We have a big event um, in the spring called Cadaver Ball and our students do like roast videos at Cadaver Ball. Um, and some of the videos have a high production value. I'm like, did, did you, did you not go to class? Like, how did you, how did you become Steven Spielberg here? So, um, <laughs> you're amazing. So, <laughs> so um, what I'll tell you guys is, uh, we have a classmate, um, at my school named Daniel Kaganov. He's a second year and he is like an expert at shooting video. So he helped me create that video for the intro. Um, and I'm awesome. sure within your medical school classes, there are probably some students with some really great talents uh, to reach out to. Right. Oh, well, yeah. All right. We do. We've, we've got some some very talented folks. And that kind of goes like with what we're looking for in the admissions process, not just your ability to make funny videos, but that you have outside interests, that you're not just a pre-med robot. Right. Right. And like Tiger King. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we want to know your opinion on Carol Baskin. <laughs> um, and now that you guys volunteered your emails, gosh, you'll, they'll just be flooded tonight. So that's okay. That'll that's be okay. Good. I'm, I'm fine yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay. So um, the next question we have is also kind of back to interviews. Um, so what resources would you recommend for students to learn more about uh, the cities, the schools, the students? Um, are there resources online, YouTube, the website to the school? Um, just, I'm just kind of spitballing, but is, is there anything you guys can think of off the top of your head? I mean, Miss Ahern, I'll let you kind of start. Sure. I mean, everybody, when they think about their dream destination, I mean, Iowa City, Iowa is number one that comes to mind, right? I mean, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, when you actually come to Iowa City, Iowa, you find out, wow, this is a hidden gem in the Midwest and they actually have decent sushi and Broadway shows that come here maybe a little later, but we still get them. Um, so the point is we realize that we need to work on this in a very big way as we're trying to recruit from a mostly virtual pl platform. Um, so I don't think I have the answer for all of it right now. One thing that I would really utilize if I was in your shoes in the application process is asking for admissions offices to let you talk to some current students through email. Um, I would, to be, really honest. And again, Iowa, we don't get 15,000 applications. We get about 4,000 ish a year. So prospective students with questions are always welcome. Um, but again, we don't get as many applications as maybe some schools do. But if a prospective student asks me, you know, I have some questions, could I be connected with a current student? Absolutely. I'm going to ask five more questions to learn a little bit about you and then find a student that I know is going to be really good fit to educate you from a student perspective that I can never provide. So I want people to be very forthcoming with asking to be connected with current students if they aren't already automatically getting those opportunities built into the process. And beyond that, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, I love that idea, having sort of students already at the school sort of serve as connections. That's great. Yeah. Ms. Kimball? Same. <laughs> We have an ambassador's program. Um, so if you tell me a little bit more about yourself, like, you know, Dr. Ms. Ahern said, we'll ask you some follow-up questions to match you with the appropriate person. But if you just have just random questions about the curriculum or whatever, we have a curriculum committee that faculty, administration, and students sit on. And some of our um, ambassadors are also on the curriculum committee. So I'll probably connect you with those people, you know? Um, so I think that's a, a great starting point. Um, the cool thing with being in Nashville is that um, people, you know, think of it as a, you know, a bachelorette party central and uh, pedal taverns and um, 18 wheelers that have been converted into um, bars that people ride up and down Broadway in. That is a true <laughs> story. Um, but we, um, are so much more than that. Um, we don't all listen to country music. Um, 
all of us have celebrity stories where country music has intersected our lives, um, but we have lots of other venues of music here. Um, we also get Broadway shows. Um, we uh, have huge like book festivals. We have hot chicken festivals. We have all sorts of different things. We have free concerts that pop up all the time. Um, so it's definitely music city, not just country music. So sometimes people have this like perception of, well, I'll have to, you know, learn who all these country music stars are. And I don't listen to country music, but I would recommend it just because when you see somebody famous, you'll at least know who they are. Like, Oh, <laughs> that's who Luke Bryan is. I know who he is now, you know? Um, so. Yeah. And uh, I, I've actually been to Nashville a couple of times now. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's very much a fun music city, a cool place to be. I need to venture up to Iowa City. That's all my bucket list now. All right, good. There you go. Okay, so the next question we have um, is about financial aid uh, rewards. So uh, a lot of people are struggling right now. Uh, employment's gone all up and down the scale. Economy's kind of everywhere. Um, so for students who maybe need it now more than ever, are do the schools have sort of funds prepared this year that are different than other years or um, a change, I should say, in terms of financial aid that will be given this year? Um, and we can start with, uh, with Ms. Kimball. Um, so for our students who are um, in this application cycle for 2021, we offer merit-based scholarships, which are either uh, full tuition scholarships or 75% tuition scholarships renewable automatically for all four years. We also offer need-based funds um, where we um, are committed to providing at least 20% of demonstrated need. Okay, fantastic. Miss mm -hmm. Ahern? Yeah, so we, you know, financial aid is one of those ever evolving <laughs> situations. And oftentimes we don't know the full picture until we get a little bit closer um, to the spring about what we'll be able to offer students in the upcoming fall. So right now we do have both need and merit-based scholarships. We give out da, 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 close to a million dollars every year for our students to attend. And most of that money does go toward non-residents. Um, we are a state school, so we do have X percentage of non-residents and then Iowa residents as well in the class. And we realize it costs non-residents more money to attend. And so typically they're receiving um, some kind of help to be here. So I don't have all the answers just yet, but know that it is top of mind. Um, and something that, you know, we have financial aid people that only work with our MD and our PA students. And so they are on top of it. When they hear about scholarships, they let people know, and we're all working together to make it as affordable as it can be. I, I will add one thing. Um, a candidate's ability to pay has no bearing on the admissions process. Um, I know that on the AMCAS application, they do ask questions like, uh, families, household income, how many people live in the house, that kind of thing. And sometimes pre-med students get a little anxious with that just because they think, gosh, if I list that I'm disadvantaged and that my household income is 25,000 a year, Vanderbilt is going to say, no, you can't afford to go here, go away. Mm -hmm. We don't. Um, I often tell people you, you could be, you know, Bill Gates, daughter. I mean, it doesn't mean that daddy Gates is going to pay your med school bill. You know I mean? There's, there's no guarantee um, on any end of the spectrum with that, but we do a lot of financial aid counseling with our uh, students uh, for second look weekend, which is our revisit weekend. We have um, the ability to meet with our director of financial aid, sit down one-on-one -on -one to see what this is going to look like. Um, for that. Because financial situation is very important. Um, the other thing is that we also accept international students. I don't know if there are any international students on this call, um, but um, if for international students, unfortunately, they're not eligible for FAFSA funds for federal loans. So they kind of have to think about what other opportunities are available for funding. Right. They're still eligible for merit and need-based scholarships through Vanderbilt, but paying a remainder, that is just something that students need to kind of consider. Right. Okay, well, we'll move on to our next question. 
Um, and this one is about secondary applications. Uh, so people are probably slowly starting to get their first secondaries if they've already submitted their applications. Uh, I remember when I was applying, there was all this chatter, um, like two weeks was sort of the magic number I was hearing around, you get it back within two weeks, otherwise they're never gonna look at it. Um, you guys have any, any take on that? Is that is that myth or reality? Uh, and this is her, I'll start with you. Well, whatever it says on Student Do Doctor Network is the reality, right? <laughs> No, I'll get into that later um, if you want that soapbox. But um, we can turn around a secondary pretty quickly. In our mind, pretty quickly it is anywhere from two days to two weeks. So just be patient with us if we're not turning them around within a couple of hours. Um, but anywhere from just a couple of days till I think two weeks would be about the longest it would take us to turn it to turn a secondary around to people. Then there can be a pretty lengthy wait for a non-resident to hear back if you're going to be invited for an interview. So I always tell people going through the process, you pick your favorite pair of patient's pants and you put them on every day um, because sometimes it takes your very favorite pair to get through the process. But I really think unless you hear something definitively, don't ever let your mind jump to places that you just don't know if it belongs there, <clears throat> like being on Student Doctor Network. Um, and you can always email us directly to ask any questions. Realize the more questions that we're fielding though, does take the process longer. So if it's questions about, you know, hey, I turned my secondary in yesterday, when can I get it back? That takes us longer to get through what we need to get through, people. So just give us a little time. But again, if it's been more than two weeks, absolutely check in because that would be a longer time to wait. All right. Ms. Kimball? So after we receive your verified AMCAS application and we have your AMCATs, um, we do review who we give secondaries to. It's not automatic. Um, so there is sometimes a little delay in that. Sometimes people are super quick on sending out secondaries to the candidates. It, just depends on who um, is looking at that batch to review. Um, and so after that occurs, you get the secondary. I would turn it in within two weeks just because why, why wait, you know? Um, because once we get your verified, I'm sorry, your secondary in and your letters of evaluation, then you go in the queue to be reviewed for a possible interview offer. Um, and if we get that information in sooner, um, it just means uh, there's more opportunities for us to discuss your, your file and your candidacy. Now we'll kind of put a little asterisk on this saying that with COVID, there is going to be a delay and we'll receive people's MCAT scores. So this is probably gonna kind of get shifted um, along the way to make the, it fair for everybody. Um, and then, We'll review to determine who's going to receive an interview. Uh, so out of about 6,000 AMCAS applications, we'll give secondaries to around 4,000 or whatever. It's not a hard cutoff or whatever. Um, and we'll interview about 550 MD, interview about 100, 120 MSTP, and then um, interview about eight of the MIDP program I mentioned earlier. Um, to yield our class. So sometimes it does take a little bit of time, like Ms. Ahern said, um, it's not always instant and it's just to hurry up and wait and, <laughs> wait, and you wait and you wait and you wait some more. So, um, but it's not over till it's over. Recognize that there are trolls on social media who will post in er erroneous information. Um, it's one of our favorite things to do is to go, who is, so-and-so username <laughs> who posted on SDN that we sent out all of our acceptances or whatever, you know, no, it's <laughs> we try to keep our website up, updated as much as possible. So I was going to say student doctor network is not the most reliable site for updates on information. Uh -uh. It's terrifying to me and I'm not in the process of applying. Same. It terrifies me. Same. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll go to our next question. Um, and that one is about curriculum changes. Uh, so do you guys know, working on the admissions, if your school is anticipating any curriculum changes uh, to the upcoming year? Um, some of these might be, I guess, more directed towards the curriculum committee, but you know, even just timelines or really anything that you guys have heard. Um, and Ms. Ahern, we can start with you. 
Hmm, well, I hate to burst bubbles here, but I don't have any groundbreaking information to share about that. Um, there hasn't been talk that I'm aware of of changing any of the grading um, at this time. We do have some classes that are graded pass or fail, and then um, we do have some distinctions in other classes, but they are not letter graded classes anymore. Um, yeah, the whole, um, the other part of the question I think was more about race and medicine and things like that. That's been a part of our curriculum for quite a while. Um, and so I do know we have our Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. The Senior Associate Dean has been working with lots of people in our um, curriculum group to make sure that, that we're doing what we need to be doing. Um, and we have been doing a lot of things proactively for many years when we revised our curriculum about five years ago. So I don't think there's any groundbreaking things. Um, one thing we are doing this summer is we have a series that's going on um, through the office I just mentioned of videos or books or clips that people have been um, absorbing and then they're getting together virtually once a week on Thursday nights to talk through some of these things for our pre-M1 class. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an exciting change that started, but we don't have any big, huge things that I'm aware of that are going to change in our curriculum. Okay. Ms. Kimball? So for grading, um, we've always been pass-fail for the first two years. Um, the way our curriculum is structured is uh, your second year is your core clerkship year. Um, and so then your third and fourth year is high honors, honors, pass, fail kind of thing. Um, our curriculum was revamped extensively about seven, eight years ago um, through a grant from the American Medical Association. Um, and we have curriculum 2.0. Um, and so much like when your phone upgrades to version 2.2.1, 2.2.3, our curriculum is constantly doing these minor tweaks to reflect society and uh, resources that we have available to teach medical education. Um, so regarding the pass fail for uh, step one, we probably won't need to revamp our curriculum at all to accommodate that. Our students have always done exceptionally well in step one. So change has been a non-issue for us. But the second question about race and medicine, um, we uh, started to create a certificate in health equity um, and it was being unveiled in January for the current students who are about to start. So the class of 2024 would be able to pick up that certificate. But we had so many students that were current students that wanted to pick up the certificate. We kind of rushed them to, to go ahead and, and start that certificate process. Um, so um, that's one of the things. We also do something called community circles where we'll get together and discuss um, some of these truly challenging topics that are going on in healthcare, um, access to healthcare, socio determinants of health, things of that nature. And our community circles consist of faculty, students, and staff. All right. I love that both of your programs are tackling those issues. That's really great Absolutely. to hear. Yes, and our Office for Diversity Affairs, much like Iowa, is doing a bunch of, of, of stuff for our students. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys the second to last question here. Uh, where is the best place for students to find updated information in this crazy, crazy, constantly changing world um, about your school's admissions policies or just whatever updates your schools have? Uh, Ms. Kimball, I'll let you start. Um, so I think the best resource for all medical schools would be the AAMC. Um, they publish the MSAR Medical School Admissions Requirement. It's an online book um, that you can purchase for like I don't know, 30 bucks or so. So it's kind of a low, lower cost for that. If you qualify for the fee assistance program through the AAMC, you get that also uh, for free. Um, and that's going to be your primary resource that all medical schools have been asked to update by the AAMC. Um, and then on our website, uh, we have, as soon as you hit the admissions website, we just kind of have like updates um, as of such and such date. Um, so any changes and stuff, we, we have it immediately on our website for y'all. Um, and then for applicants, as if things shift, something changes, um, we will message out um, because we have your email addresses on your AMCAS applications. Okay, Miss Ahern. Complete sames. We, yeah, check the MSAR and then our website will have a banner 
um, at the top with the really relevant COVID related changes. That's one of my pet peeves now is when you visit a website and you can't tell, is this COVID times? Is it not? What's going on here? So I'm pretty nuts about that, making sure it's very clear um, in a banner that's really set out so you can see everything that changes. Great, great. That's all really great information to share. Um, we're going to move to the conclusion portion of tonight. We're already there. Um, so we've heard a lot of great information from both of our panelists tonight, and I wanna thank you both again for participating. So for this last part, I'd like to ask each of you just to share one takeaway from tonight that you'd like to share with the audience. Um, Miss Ahern, we can start with you. And that can be about any portion of the town hall or anything that you heard. No pressure. Um, no, I think that, you know, I think there's so many things that Ms. Kimball said that were really well said. And I, I really want people to just to leave this leave this session feeling more empowered than maybe we started um, 51 minutes ago. And just knowing that, yes, things feel very much in upheaval and a little bit tumultuous to many people through the process. But know that we've got these processes pretty well ironed out. And don't think that any of this is going to send us in complete upheaval. We're ready for you. We're ready with open arms. Um, we're ready to read all the applications. And so please feel empowered also to know that admissions committees might be a little bit more open-minded about things than they ever have been before. If you just heard a strange noise, it is my dog digging in his dish telling that telling me she needs water. I'm sorry for that. That's all I have. Miss <laughs> um, Kimball, uh, any final thoughts from you? Sure. I just, I really hope that the uh, applicants and future applicants that are on this call recognize that we're not scary monster people that you should fear. We don't get excited about rejecting people and being the the nose and the mean, or you know, or, you know, strict policies and, and stuff like that. Like we all work in admissions or on admissions committees or whatever because we really are excited about working with the future of medicine. Like. Um, our faculty love it. Like our um, students actually start with us on Wednesday uh, for our first year class. So we start a little early. Um, I know. And literally all day today, I've had people email me like, I'm so excited. Aren't you so excited? It's like, I don't know. We're just, we're excited about this. We enjoy what we do. Um, so if you ever feel like, okay, Am I doing this right? Is will med schools understand this? You're more than welcome to reach out to us. Um, hopefully, with you know having the difference between like a public school and a private school, you recognize that these things are very still very common themes. Like we're understanding to the fact that there's really truly a loss of control with when you're able to take the MCAT. Um, you know, some of you are finishing up your last year in, in college and still not really sure if it's going to be in person or online and you know it, there there are so many um challenges that you're facing but one of the things that we're all looking for is resiliency in our applicants and so um you have demonstrated resiliency by going through the application process and cycle um so yeah um and i just want to add on to one thing that you mentioned miss kimball about um, you know, you guys are really there because you love working with students. Um, and we saw tonight, you guys are not scary monsters. I had no idea what an admissions dean, director, et cetera, it looks like when I was a pre-med. Um, you guys were not the image of what I thought, but I'm so glad that you are because you guys are. <laughs> um, yeah, so we try to be as transparent as possible. Um, that's one of like at least at Vanderbilt, one of our big pushes is to be as transparent as possible with the application process. Um, so we really want you guys to feel comfortable reaching out to us, so. Absolutely. Yep. So uh, now that we reached the end, I'm gonna add Miller and Troy back onto the screen. Um, I wanna thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Miss Kimball, Miss Ahern, you guys were phenomenal and you guys were just so great. Um, special thanks again, Troy Miller, for helping to organize tonight's events. 
Uh, thanks to Dr. Kelly, who provided us with a streaming platform. Another special thanks to Daniel Kagnoff, the M2 at Wake Forest, who made our videos. To all of our viewers, please share this with your peers and institutions. We want this to reach as many people as possible and to share this important information. Please follow our Facebook page on medical education and admissions topics affected by COVID at facebook.com slash COVID med ed um, and facebook.com slash young physicians. We'd love for you to share your feedback and continue the discussions we had here tonight. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, so thank you for behalf of all of us. Thank you, Noah. You did an awesome job. Thank you. Thanks y'all for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.